development services and Food Co-op 500. We're very pleased. Uh, we have over 50 people who've registered for today's seminar, and we're glad you're here with us. Um, we um, are pleased to have Joel Dahlgren uh, joining us, and um, he's going to be giving our, the presentation today. Now, Mark, I want to remind you to start the recording. Yes, thank you. I did. Uh, good. And at this point, um, I will turn it over to Joel. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, and just for everyone's uh, information, Christine Nardi is also going to be joining me. We're going to be a team in this presentation, and Christine is going to um, act as a, let's say, an active participant, asking questions as we go along. Hopefully, it'll help flush out the uh, presentation and, and make it more interesting. Um, let me say in starting that I've worked with cooperatives for over 25 years in, in a number of different sectors. And I think that when it comes to food cooperatives, um, uh, all of you are incredibly lucky to be you know, affiliated with um, CDS Consulting Group because um, there is not a group like, uh, like it in any other co-op sector that I'm aware of. And the kind of uh, experience and talent and um, leadership that group brings to food cooperatives is, I think, uh, unparalleled. The presentation today is on legal issues for new food co-ops. And um, I have a few opening slides uh, that talk about governance and about opening um, when to form the co-op. And then I'm going to get into a little bit of an uh, accounting uh, presentation on subchapter T of the uh, Internal Revenue Code, because I think it's important as co-op um, organizers and incorporators and leaders that you have a sense of how subchapter T works and what the accounting looks like so that uh, when you're talking with, with people that you can um, you know have an understanding yourself and explain it to them. Okay, when to bring the co-op into existence, I, I think that you know sooner than later, and uh, my recommendation is that you started as soon as there's a core small group of people um, who are interested in, in evaluating the formation of a co-op. Um, there's lots of work that goes into um, the project, and the earlier that the corporate existence is formed and, and you know, alive, um, the sooner that that entity, rather than any of you as organizers, can um, contract with outside parties for services. And don't be distracted by the finality. It, it feels, you know, like when you file the Articles of Incorporation or the Articles of Organization, that somehow that this is a final act and you have to get everything right in the Articles of Incorporation. Um, and I, I don't want you to feel that way because it's relatively easy to amend those documents as you go along. And it's not surprising to want to amend the documents as you go along. Uh, to bring the co-op into existence, we have to file the Articles of Incorporation or organization. We have to obtain a federal employer ID number. That can be done online. Um, we have to file form IRS uh, 8832 for entity classification. And in the case of the, of the co-op, I should say we file that if the articles of, an, of organization provide for the creation of an entity under an unincorporated um, statute. And one of the, the, the new co-op statutes all provide for the creation of an unincorporated association. But to be taxed under subchapter T, we want to be a corporation and the only way we can become a corporation in the eyes of the IRS is if we file 8832 and choose um, to be taxed as a corporation. Um, we prepare organizational minutes of the first meeting. You know, typically the first minutes show um, where the bank of deposit is going to be, who the first directors are, and um, uh, take care of any other miscellaneous items that we want to have down in the minutes of the organize, of the um, first meeting of the board. Uh, consider a director and officer liability insurance. I think for a lot of your co-ops, it's simply too expensive to start out. But I just learned the other day 
and I keep learning as I go along on all of these issues, but um, I was told that in one case, uh, an organizer of a co-op found out that her homeowner policy did provide some uh, protection as long as she was a volunteer. And so I would just say, check with your uh, homeowner insurance carrier to uh, to see what kind of coverage your your own homeowner's policy provides. <clears throat> uh, significant early challenges. I, I first of all, I think it's very important that you use you know consultants, and and I think I'm biased for toward CDS consultants. Um, the board of directors has to ex exert some leadership. The reason I mention this is that I think sometimes, particularly in co-ops, um, we think of them as, as egalitarian organizations and that there is, you know, we're all on equal terms and uh, that we're each of us a sovereign and, and really um, no one um, exercises any power over anybody else. But the board of directors um, is the leader of the organization. And I think it's important that the board have um, as much as possible a single mind about what is going on and and um, that they communicate with members um, more often than not, but I, I don't think the communication should be of a of a um, non substantive matter. I you know just I don't think it should be communication for the sake of communication. But I think the members should be communicated with frequently. Um, and I think that it's important for the board to respond to at least some criticism, uh, because I think if, if it's not responded to, uh, there are occasions when that could be fatal for the board uh, and the co-op. Uh, OK, in terms of governance, um, I read a, a Harvard Law Review several years ago that I, I thought was very interesting. And um, the subject was, what makes a great board great? And uh, the author of the, of the review said, it's not audit committees, not executive sessions, it's not ownership of equity by anyone, it's not outside directors, uh, not skill levels, or even attending regular meetings. Um, he said that what makes a great board great is that directors trust each other that dissent is allowed, even encouraged. Directors feel accountable to each other. Um, that politics are managed and put up on the table for everyone to see. And that directors respect each other. I think this is an important component of a, a food cooperative that's beginning, because I, I think right from the start, um, it's important for the board um, to be working toward uh, it and making itself great board as you move forward. Uh, sometimes in a cooperative, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to forget that the cooperative is actually a separate being from the members. And there, there are times when you as a director um, will actually be forced to take an opposing view to what may be in your own self-interest. I go to a lot of farm supply co-op meetings where if you're there at the beginning of the meeting before any before it's called to order, you'll hear directors talking to the manager about, well, we're, we're too high priced on LP gas, and we're too high priced on our feed, and we're too high priced on all of this stuff. And all of those statements, I, I've never heard a, a, a director say to a manager, we should increase the price of our LP gas, or we should increase the price of our feed. Every time they, they, they make a statement that we should decrease prices, they're, they're talking out of their own self-interest and not out of the interest of the co-op. And so it, there is this natural tension, I believe, between you as a director and your status as a member. And I think when you're a director, you have to be able to fight off those tendencies to think like a member. Um, Let me, I'm going to skip on here to um, conclusions for directors, individual directors. Now, this is Joel Dahlgren speaking, okay? This isn't, there is no black letter law on this, but I feel like individual directors don't have a license to communicate independently of the board. Um, 
I don't feel like, and I say this tongue in cheek, I don't feel like there is a First Amendment um, free speech right when it comes to the board of directors. Um, if opposing views are held strongly enough, that is, if a director feels strongly enough that the board is going in the wrong uh, direction, then oftentimes my recommendation to that person and the board uh, is for that director to resign and then for him or her to take up their fight with the board as a member, um, but not as a director. Basically, a board of directors, I think, of a co-op is no different than any other organization. When the majority has spoken, then all of the directors, um, we'd like to see them fall in behind all of the, all of the other directors. Um, otherwise, you're substituting your judgment for the judgment of the board. And um, we want there to be as strong and clear a voice as possible when it comes to the uh, board of directors' actions. Any, let me just stop here. Any questions at all about that? Because uh, I know that sounds pretty tough and pretty terse and, and probably un-American. Um, Joe, this is, this is Chris Nardi, and I just wanted to follow up with a, a question that, that goes back to your original conversation about bringing a cooperative into existence. Yeah. At that point, you mentioned that you think it's it's best practice to make sure that you build a line of communication uh, between members of the co-op uh, and and prospective board members, so that the the initial development of the co-op isn't stalled or torpedoed. And then um, moving forward to the point where you actually have directors and you have members, you're talking about how there's a attention and the directors, in your view, need to. Uh, recognize that they are directors and that they have a different role and if they they are unable to do that productively then perhaps they become members and and uh, discuss their concerns as members so it seems to me that those are uh, a little bit at odds or tension and perhaps a little challenging and what might be some examples of, of how you could build communication with with members and at the same time build trust with with directors well that's a great question Chris and I, I my response to that is that I, I think there are two different things we're talking about there. One is the board of directors, which I see as, as sort of an entity unto itself. And I think that the board, um, the directors on the board have to manage um, their own relationships between each other and, and try to resolve um, issues between themselves so that the board presents to the members um, as solid um, a view of what the board thinks and where they're going as they can. Um, the issue of communication with members then I think is, it, it sort of follows from the first that the communication with members will be stronger if if the board can speak with one voice and a strong voice that, you know, this is what we've decided and this is where we're, where we're going. Um, I had a situation a few years ago with a co-op here in the upper Midwest where the, the board made a decision because the co-op was losing money um, to sell off a service station that was the, the biggest um, uh, problem for the co-op. The board made the decision the next day, one of the directors went out, and you know I think each director sort of has their own constituency among the members. Next day, the director goes out and with his consistency constituency and you know, he stirred up a lot of a lot of resistance to the idea that the co-op was going to sell the service station um, it turned out that the board reversed themselves didn't sell the station and then the co-op went under um, I think in in that kind of a situation you know not only does that director have some personal liability for for what happened but the rest of the board has some personal liability as well because the other members who, who, you know, would have wanted the station sold to save the co-op and to save their equity, um, they have a cause of action against the board of directors for, for breaching their fiduciary obligation. Um, there's lots of cases like that that I've seen over the years where an important decision was, was reached by the board of directors, and then 
the, that same night or the next morning, one of the directors started to undermine the decision among the members. And um, those, those directors thought, you know, that they almost had a duty to do that. But from my point of view, if they felt so strongly about that, that they wanted to um, oppose, publicly oppose the board, then I believe they need to resign from the board um, and, and then take up their fight as a member against the board and, and, not, as a, and not as a director. Uh, make any sense or? Yes, thanks. Did you want to take a, uh, additional questions? Sure. If there are... There's one that's along the same lines here. If, if board members can communicate, cannot communicate independently, can they communicate when members approach them with problems or concerns, or do they direct them to a board meeting? I think that and the, the, I'm conveying a message that's too strong because I, it isn't that I think that directors cannot communicate with members, you know, individually, but I think there's a, let's say, a quote-unquote party line that the board has developed and carries forward, and I, and I feel like the directors need to be able to support that party line. I think you absolutely need to be able to talk with members about anything that they come to you with. Um, but when you do that, I, I think it's important to remember that you as a director have no power yourself over, over anything related to that issue. And that the most you can do is bring that, and should, you should bring that back to the board and, and let the board decide um, what it is that they, that they think they should do. Okay, I'm going to move on. I, I, I want to, to talk about subchapter T and the accounting a little bit because I think it's important for all of you to have a, a, an appreciation of, in very broad strokes, what happens under subchapter T. And basically, sub, sub T says any corporation can be taxed under sub T as a co op, and basically, if three things exist. One is for the economic returns to be equitably allocated to patrons on the basis of patronage. Um, the second thing is for there to be democratic control, one member, one vote. And then the third thing is subordination of capital, which we usually think of as, as paying no more than 8 to 10% um, as a preferred dividend on, on capital. Everything else goes to the patrons on the basis of, of uh, patronage. Now, back under economic returns, I distinguish pat patrons who have the financial patronage right from members who have the voting rights plus the, plus the financial patronage rights. If non-members are, are permitted to patronize the co-op uh, and receive a patronage refund, they would be patrons but not members. A lot of the cooperatives I work with um, well, let me, let me step back. A lot of the cooperatives I work with outside of the food co-op sector um, have both members and patrons. My experience within the food co-op, and I, I can't say this is, is very deep because I haven't quizzed a lot of cooperative managers about this, but my sense is that um, most of the time only members are patrons and that, for example, if, if I come off the street and go to the St. Peter Food Cooperative and um, buy something that I would not be eligible to receive a, a patronage refund. Um, so that that income from that sale would be what we call non-patronage earnings. Um, Subchapter T requires that we have a pre-existing obligation to distribute patronage earnings on a patronage basis and if you look in the in the primer in the bylaws, uh, you will see um, the. Uh, oh, I was hoping I had the yeah, hard copy. Uh, if you look in the primer on page 50 and 51, you'll see there 
the uh, pre-existing obligation. Now, under the under subchapter T, we end up with almost like let's let's say two columns of earnings for the co-op. One is patronage earnings; those are the ones that are traceable to patrons, and then non-patronage earnings, which are not traceable to patrons, or are de minimis because we've we've said that we're not going to prepare a check for less than let's say 50 cents. Um, Subchapter T requires that we prepare and distribute written notice of allocation and qualified checks within eight and a half months of the fiscal year end. We have to send 1099 PATRs, patrons, until we've filed IRS Form 3491, which exempts us from having to send out 1099 PATRs. And then we file the 1120C tax return within eight and a half months of the fiscal year end. I don't want you to get too wrapped up in any of this. I don't think any of this is, is overly important that that you um, have a real uh, deep understanding of this. A written notice of allocation is basically, let's just think of it as a letter, okay? It's a letter that we send out to the person um, and it, it says how much they have been allocated on the books of the co-op. Um, Members are supposed to consent to report the patronage earnings uh, on their tax returns. Now, remember, in your case in particular, um, the the income that's received uh, is not reportable because um, the purchases were made for personal or family purposes. And so, basically, what the IRS says is you're you're making those purchases with income on which you've already paid tax. And the patronage refund is just a return of that um, income upon which tax was already paid. Still, though, we, we, need, the, we need the consent in the um, bylaws, or we need to obtain consent in writing, or we need to obtain consent by um, endorsing and cashing a qualified check. So there's basically three ways to get consent. I always say you can never have too many consents. So in your case, you're probably always going to be, um, you'll have the bylaw consent. And you're also, I would propose that if you, if you do make money and send out patronage refunds, that you should um, include um, an endorsement on the check. Uh, the qualified check, this is simply describes what the endorsement is supposed to say. Um, just so you know, uh, if you do prepare a check and send it out, and then, so in terms of our uh, sending docs to the members, um, for new members, they should receive a, a bylaw notification from us saying that, you know, there is a consent provision uh, in the bylaws or, and or, because there, you can never have too many consents, we, you may want to build the consent into the membership agreement. And then annually, uh, if we make money, and if we make a distribution to members, we would send out a, a written notice of allocation, a qualified check, and a 1099 PATR. Okay, here's how it looks from an accounting point of view. Um, let's just assume this is a 12-month income statement. The co-op had 500,000 of business, patronage earnings. Now, thus, the earnings that are traceable to patrons are $10,000. Non-patronage earnings, let's just say people like me, um, who you don't keep track of because I'm not a patron, um, walk in and do business and you end up with $10,000 of non-patronage earnings. Uh, the co-op tax rate uh, is low on the first you know, 50,000, so it's 15%. And the cash patronage has to be at least a minimum of 20%. It can be more than 20%, but it has to be at least 20%. Okay, so the income statement, here, here's the way it looks. We have, as I said before, two columns. We have 10,000 of patronage earnings, 10,000 of non-patronage earnings. We pay income tax on the $1,500, or $1,500, leaving us $8,500 going into the capital reserve. On the patronage earnings side, we have $10,000. We pay no income tax because we receive a patronage deduction um, for those earnings, but we have to pay out um, $2,000 in as a cash patronage refund, and we end up with $8,000 of allocated equities 
on the on the books of the co-op. So in this year, from, from operations, we've generated a total of $16,500 of equity from our earnings after the payment of taxes and after the payment of the cash patronage refund. Now, if we look at this from the point of view of the um, individual patron, let's just assume they did $500 worth of business with the co-op, which is 0.1% of everything. So they would receive a $10 uh, patronage distribution, $2 in a qualified check, and $8 of allocated equities that you know we would uh, given them a written notice of a written notice uh, of allocation to. The allocated equities, the eight dollars, that is, um, are redeemed according to redemption policies adopted and modified by the board. Um, and theoretically, that equity never has to be redeemed. And I think in a lot of cases, uh, your your food co-ops. My experience has been that they are not very aggressive about redeeming equity. And from my point of view, that's just fine because. Um, when you start to redeem equity and you start to develop expectations about how quickly that equity will be redeemed, um, it can become quite a, a cash flow issue for the co-op. Nothing wrong with redeeming equity, um, but be careful about how you um, communicate those policies to members so that they know that there isn't necessarily an entitlement, that uh, redemptions only occur as and when the, the board has determined the co-op has adequate cash and balance sheet strength. Joel? Yeah. Could, could we take, I have a couple of questions about the Form 8832 that might be addressed at this time. Is, yeah. Is that right? Uh, one is just generally, when you get incorporated, does your attorney file that, or is it something you need to take care of? Um, what happens if you don't do it right away when you get incorporated? Well, if we didn't, if we file under, let me back up. If we organize the co-op under one of the new co-op statutes, and um, which is an unincorporated association, we're treated as a partnership if we have more than one member. Okay, so we don't want to be treated as a partnership for tax purposes. So if, if we don't file 8832 and check corporation, and I, th I think there's a 75-day window of time after the incorporation. Um, if we don't file the 8832, then, then we are treated as a, as a partnership. So it's important to file the 8832 within the time frame. And if, if your attorney uh, doesn't file it, you know, I, I think that, that he should, he or she should be recommending that, you know, that you file it with the IRS. I believe the 8832 can also be done online, just like the SF4 for the federal employer ID number can be done online. And Joel, this is Chris Nardi. You could also speak with your CPA if you had one about filing that as well. Correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, at at this time, actually, you know, I don't want to put a lot of obligation on the on the CDS consultants, but Probably at this particular moment in time, the, 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 the professionals who the co-op will have the most contact with are, are probably their, their, their consultant, Stuart. So perhaps we could say that you know the, the CDS consultant is probably as likely a person as the auditor or the attorney to make that recommendation. Yeah. I think you may have partially addressed this, but you might want to clarify. Why don't we want to be treated as a partnership? What's the difference in taxes? Well, the difference in, in taxes with a with a partnership, uh, let me just go back here. Um, if you, I'm on this uh, slide now that shows the two columns of, of earnings. In a partnership, that entire $20,000 of earnings would would all flow down and be allocated to to the to the partners uh, to, that is to the members. The the partnership would pay no tax at all at its level, and and the um, each of the members would pay tax at their on their individual tax returns. What's nice about the sub T co-op is that for tax purposes it is actually a separate taxable entity for non-patronage earnings. 
and you notice here this $8,500 of capital reserve, it's, it's nice to be able to build some reserve and some, some balance sheet strength um, so that we have a stronger balance sheet. If we do it as a partnership, we end up with no reserve. We end up with all of the income having been allocated to the members. And in a lot of cases, the, the co-op is not going to be able to redeem that equity. Maybe some of it it, it couldn't redeem ever um, because every, every business needs some permanent capital. Um, so then we end up with members having paid tax on something that they may never receive. Um, well, I, I take that back. I suspect that the the income in the hands of the members is probably not taxable um, because for the same reasons as that it's not taxable at the at the member level. But we end up with a with a balance sheet where there is a lot of well, there is no equity for the entity itself, and everything is allocated out to to patrons. Any questions on that? Sure. Let's see. I think we're pretty much covered what we we have coming in on the, that issue. Um, let me let me say also, Stuart, that with regard to sub K, it is a it is a far more complex um, system of taxation than is the the sub T co-op, and um, I think it's generally something that we want to stay away from. Um, sub K is used on occasion in, in larger, very large co-ops where they go out and raise, you know, millions of dollars of capital. There are sometimes some tax advantages that sub K provides over sub T, but 98% of the co-ops I work with are, are sub T co-ops. So this is just a natural place for us to for us to be, I think. And Jill, just one quick follow-up question about the allocated equities. Do you have in mind or have any examples of instances where co-ops have, in fact, um, uh, redeemed the allocated equities and, and have ha had a successful policy for doing so? Yes. There's, there's a number of cooperatives out there. Um, uh, oftentimes, the, the policies are to redeem the equities at, let's say, a certain age, maybe age 70, or and or at death. Um, some cooperatives are have a have a solid enough P and L statement that they actually can redeem equity. I guess the quickest I've seen is is five years, um, which is which is very very fast. Um, by and large, most of the cooperatives I work with have policies where they're redeeming equity at age 70 or at death. Now, let me just say again that that is outside of my food co-op experience. With regard to my to my food food co-ops that I work with, I guess I'm finding that, that a lot of them maybe have never allocated any patronage earnings and have built up a, you know, a, whatever they've made, they've paid tax on and put into a capital reserve. Um, there is a push in the last 12 months for more of the food cooperatives to amend their bylaws to allow them to, to you know, we put in the pre-existing obligations so we enable them to to declare a patronage refund. So I, I think the issue, Chris, of redemptions is going to become more of an issue for food cooperatives, let's say, you know, five, ten years from now. Okay, so up to this point, we've just sort of dealt with the earnings under sub T. Now I want to give you a picture of what the, the co-op's um, equity account would actually look like. I just got a little ringing in my ear. Can you still hear me? Yeah, Joel, it sounds like um, try unplugging your headset and speaking into the handset. Okay. There hear me now? Yep. All right. Um, this presents what the, what the co-op's equity account looks like after the end. Let's just assume that we've got 500 members and they each bought a $100 membership. So we'd have memberships of $50,000, we'd have allocated equity of $8,000, and we'd have a capital reserve of $8,500. Total patron equity 
of $66,500. If the co-op was organized with capital stock, and that's one of the things that you uh, need to resolve early on when you form the co-op is whether or not to form it with capital stock. And I, I recommend not because I think the use of the word stock um, gives members the impression that they're dealing with the security or that they have um, you know, a proprietary interest in, in the proceeds uh, from a liquidation of the co-op when, when really you don't. Um, but some co-ops are formed with stock and that's certainly, certainly fine. I, this is my personal preference is to organize without stock on a membership basis. Okay, what happens in a dissolution? Let's just say that we've got this co-op with $125,000 of assets and $58,500 of, of uh, debt, and then we've got our memberships, our allocated equity, capital reserve. So we've got $125,000 of assets and $125,000 of total liabilities. Well, if we sell the assets for $100,000, because that's, that's what the market says they're worth, we pay off the liabilities first, dollar for dollar. And then under the bylaws in the Frimmer, we would end up paying back $41,500 of those memberships. Um, we'd pay off none of the allocated equity um, or anything else because by the time we've paid off $41,500, we've, we've uh, used all of our cash available. Under the second alternative, when we've got 150000 that we're able to sell the assets for, we pay off the liabilities, and um, we have we can pay off 50,000 of memberships. We can pay off the 8,000 of allocated equity, and we actually have down here in the bottom right-hand corner, we actually have $33,500 left. Now, that under subchapter T is supposed to be paid to on the basis of historical patronage. Okay. The members don't have a, ha, have a right to this $33,500. This is paid to on the basis of historical patronage. So the bottom line from the financial in, information we just walked through is that the economic returns from patronage business during the life of the co-op are returned to patrons and not owners on the basis of patronage. Uh, at dissolution, the economic returns that are left after we've paid off the memberships and the allocated equity is distributed on the basis of, of patronage. And those who provide capital um, are usually not paid anything, and if they are, it's something less than 10%. It's important, I think, from you, for, for you as organizers to have this sense of what happens under sub-T. We, we have the earnings that flow through Anything that's patronage, we distribute, and we um, pay at least 20% tax on, or 20% cash refund on. Anything that's non-patronage, we pay tax on just like a corporation would. And everything flows through ultimately for the benefit of the patrons, not the owners. So when we're looking at the co-op's formation and, and you're doing something with um, the documents that go out, here's some of the disclosures that I'd like you to consider. Nothing magical about these, but I, I think it's important for people to know that membership is a, is a unique opportunity. Um, at the bottom of this page, um, we, we anticipate that members are going to join because they're interested in, in procuring healthy food products. Um, Um, the co-op is unique in that patrons control it and are paid the economic returns as opposed to owners. Therefore, you should know that the membership stock or uh, you purchase is not expected to appreciate, uh, nor will a dividend or other return be paid on it. Um, consequently, from our point of view, the membership stock is not a security uh, under the law, which is why a lot of you, uh, this depends upon uh, one state to the next law, but typically, and oftentimes it's the case that co-ops um, have exemptions from registration of securities under the law. And, and one of the reasons for that is that when you get right down to it, the membership stock is theoretically not even a security. 
And further, your voting privileges depend on you patronizing the co-op. If you do not patronize it, your voting privileges could and probably will be canceled by the action of the Board of Directors. Uh, nothing assures a co-op success, blah, 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 uh, and the Board is not under a compulsion to redeem any of the price that you pay for your membership. Um, and that's also true of the allocated equity that you earn from doing business at the co-op. Um, that's the that's the conclusion of the of the um, presentation. But I'm hoping that maybe we've got some more questions coming, Stuart, that that will um, help us to kind of illuminate more of the issues that I've not gone over or gone over uh, without enough discussion. Uh, there are a, a couple questions, Joel. I just want to check, Stuart. I I'm thinking that you're not on the call right now. Is that true? Okay. Um, so I'll uh, I'll I'll channel Stuart's voice. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are just a couple of of kind of maybe detail uh, kind of questions uh, on that material. Uh, one is um, is the form. 8832 necessary only if you filed as an unincorporated association in your state. In other words, if we've incorporated under our state statutes, then do we need to file the 8832? Well, theor theoretically not, because the default is that if we filed so that the entity is a corporate as opposed to an unincorporated entity, if it's a if it's an incorporated entity then the default is that we are a a corporation for tax purposes. Okay. Thank you. Um, another kind of detailed question on the um, the descriptions that you had there. Would you recommend that those be in a separate document or as part of your application? And I assume they mean the the membership application. Yeah, I, I think, Mark, that they the most logical place for them is in the 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 application. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the application, now, as an attorney looking at this from a point of view of of a securities law issue, we want to give as much information as we can, so that when people purchase a membership, that they're they're making an informed consent to to purchase it, and so, you know, I'd like at a minimum for something like those disclosures conveying sort of the message that's there to be in the application. But I'd also want there to be other information, kind of discussing what it is the money will be used for, um, you know, right. that nothing is, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. um, if you don't like your state statute, can you form under another state statute? Yes. Yes, you can. Now, that brings us back to a securities law issue, though, because in a lot of cases, um, when it comes to, to securities registration, we have two issues, state law and federal law. And federal law provides an exemption for intrastate offerings. And so if your co-op is, is going to be raising capital just from, from members within one state, we we might want to use that interstate exemption from registration, and if that's the case, we'll want to form an entity to use the interstate exemption. We have to use an entity that's formed in that state. Okay. Um, a listener thought that some state statutes might have different rules regarding the question of redemption of owner shares. And wondered uh, just generally, is it the the state law uh, is the controlling law? Is that true? Is that Trump? And then, what if uh, the stock was established with par value? Well, typically, the um, states certainly have the right to control the issue of redemption. I'm not familiar with any states that necessarily do. Um, and in fact, a few years ago, the Financial Accounting Standards Board was talking about implementing a, a standard that would have required for co-ops all of the allocated equity to be treated as debt because 
the FASB's position was that allocated equity um, looks and feels like debt because a lot of co-ops treat it as you know something that has to be redeemed. And we did an extensive sort of news alert about that and looked at a number of different states' laws. And there are court cases out there that that hold and in various situations under very extreme situations that perhaps a board could be forced to redeem equity. But the lion's share of the case law is that redemptions are clearly within the discretion of the board of directors. And usually, you know, we think of the board as representing the views of the members. And I find that, that you can count on directors to redeem equity as fast as they can because they, they it's something that they want to do to show that the co-op is working. Okay, thanks for that. Um, can you explain how patronage refund would work in a state where the only option is to file as a business corporation, assuming you've decided not to be a nonprofit? If there is no provision under the business corporation statute for member basis as distinct from stock basis, would the allocated equity have to be distributed as stock? Well, I, I think that you could organize a co-op under that situation um, and have it issue stock um, as and for its, its allocated equity. Um, most, you know, I would recommend that that be non-certificated, which, which means that the co-op doesn't have to send out certificates to people because it's, it's mostly a nuisance. Um, remember that in a co-op, the shares don't really represent um, anything uh, in terms of a, um, a voting right or control. Um, all they are is, is evidence that something has been uh, allocated into your name on the co-op's books. So um, we could use uncertificated shares, but I would I would submit that unless the statute prohibits prohibits the company from, for example, using equity credits. And a lot of co-ops um, simply make a notation on their books that, you know, we had this much earnings and we've allocated to you, you know, this much um, equity. And we've made a notation on our books to, to represent that. And you should, this is what the written notice of allocation would accomplish, but it would basically say, you know, you have a certain number of dollars of equity on our books. Um, I think uh, un unless the statute prohibits that from occurring, I think that the the corporation could provide in its bylaws and articles of incorporation that it was going to make notations on its books uh, to represent the uh, the patronage allocations. Okay, and good luck with all that. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Uh, here's a couple more questions, and then I'll I'll, uh, I'll uh, see if Chris and 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 or Marilyn have any that they'd like to um, check in with you on Joel. One person is listening, uh, is asking um, about preferred shares, and they're planning on needing to bring in more capital, and wonder if uh, the member uh, must first hold a basic share to be able to purchase a preferred share, and how are these treated for tax purposes? Well, um, a preferred share can be sold to anyone, a member or non or non member, um, unless your your articles or bylaws would you know prohibit that from happening. Usually, that's not the case. Um, and then when we get down to the issue of paying dividends on on that share, um, my understanding of this, and I don't actually have any co-ops right now that are, are paying preferred dividends. But my understanding is, like, in the case where we just, you know, where I just um, uh, talked about with the $10,000 of patronage earnings and $10,000 of non-patronage earnings, that the co-op could actually, um, you can't deduct the dividend for tax purposes, but for purposes of determining the patronage refund that's, that goes out to the member, we could deduct that portion, let's say half of the preferred dividend against the patronage earnings before we figure out 
how much is allocated to patrons. Makes sense, or uh, I, I can't tell if I'm if this sounds like garbly gook or if I'm. Joel, you're 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 doing a good job. Uh, and here's and here's a, a a follow up question on that 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 someone wrote in earlier. Um, person commented that um, that they've seen personally some quote unquote normal civilian lawyers give grossly incorrect advice to boards, um, and wondered uh, how how you suggest you know boards think about using uh, uh, attorneys with with uh, co-op experience even when uh, there might be a pro bono free lawyer in town that you know without without that co-op experience what's your sense of that well I feel like I end up doing a lot of pro bono work anyway so <laughs> you just as well talk to a co-op attorney for pro bono I, you know, I don't know. I, I think there's lots of ways to, to, to do all of this, and I don't feel like there's any one way is correct. And so I, I'd be hard pressed to, you know, even, even say that, whatever advice that was, that it was necessarily wrong. Um, but I, I think, like for example, through CDS, um, and through the co-op community, there, there are a group of attorneys that, that have a pretty good handle on, on this stuff. And um, you know that you should seek those people out. Um, Christine and I are, are working together with co-op stuff, and, and Christine wants to develop her co-op practice more. And my my plan with Christine is that we're going to work together on stuff, and that um, if she has questions, that that she'll be contacting me. So, you know, between Christine and I, I mean, there's there's two people that they can call, but there are others out there too that can be called. And uh, Christine, any uh, comments on the uh, on this most recent batch of Q and A? I just have one sort of general practical practical question that I think might be helpful for listeners to hear, and and that's for for those who are really in the organizing stage. But one of the questions that that I've gotten when I've worked with cops in the past is. Uh, what's how long does it take, and what's the cost for for basically starting up a, a cooperative? And and I know personally some of that depends on exactly what what work is being done. Um, but Joel, I don't know if you have any kind of general thoughts of, about time frame or or general cost involved in this kind of work. Well, you know, like with with the Primers Articles of Incorporation. Um, as serving as a as a template, I mean, I believe that, and in, in each state is going to be a little bit different. Perhaps you may have to add or subtract information from the primer articles. But basically, it's the the filing fee um, average is let's say 150 bucks with with the state, and so for 150 bucks, um, you could file your own articles of incorporation or articles of organization. Um, in fact, a lot of states have templates on their websites that they can use. So I never feel, Chris, like at least filing the articles, you know, that to me is not a place where I feel like I make any money because it's such a, to me, such an administrative function. Um, combining and going, circling back to the idea that, you know, there's nothing final about filing the articles. They can always be amended. So if a we, if we see that we've done something that we don't like, and we can always look, go back and later and and amend it. Um, I I think you know that in terms of attorney time, it strikes me that you know if that an attorney with with um, even a, a modest amount of experience with co-ops, you could easily say that you know the attorney should probably take no more than an hour to to help assemble a set of articles of incorporation to to file. Well, and a lot of it, I think, depends on whether the organizers that you're working with are, are willing to do some of the groundwork as well. Absolutely. And be partners with you in the process. Absolutely. And the more that, that they're willing to do that, the, the, the cheaper it gets. I so that all of a sudden we're back in pro bono land. I do have a couple of, of more questions on some details, and um, and I also wondered if, if Marilyn, if you're... Um, 
you have any questions that you would like to direct to uh, Joel or Chris. One question that comes up uh, a lot for co-ops that I'm working with is related to the um, the member or the patron's tax obligations, and you emphasize needing to to have their consent clearly laid out. Um, but it's it, it does turn out to be confusing for them since most of the sales through a food co-op or to consumers for their personal use and therefore their patronage are uh, their, their patronage dividend distributions are not taxable and yet you have to provide them all the consent because the IRS requires you to. Yeah. So I wonder if you could just clarify the the obligation of the of the member for for um, accounting for their tax the, the, the tax implication of their patronage dividend. Well, I, I guess there are two ways I've been told to handle this um, by by auditors. You know, when you're looking at the individual person, either you don't report it at all because it, it just simply is an income to you, even though you've received the 1099, or um, there's a way of that on your tax, and that which, is, by the way, is what I follow. <laughs> or number two would be to you know, report it somewhere on the on the 1040, and then subtract it somewhere, um, so that it ends up to be you know zero income on on your tax return. I know it's confusing. The the co-op is under an obligation to to make the consent and to you know make sure it's given, uh, make sure they can they can um, have a record of it. Um, as soon as we file 3491 um, and receive IRS, you know, approval for an exemption, then we no longer have to to um, send out the 1099s, or you know, we still need to do the consent. We still need to make sure we kind of follow that as a as a as a, um, a purely uh, mechanical thing. But at the end of the day, there is no tax paid. By the consumers. Joel, I have a couple more questions for you. Um, uh, one is just getting your recommendation on uh, when an uh, organizing group or a board is working with a CPA. Um, uh, is it your sense that it's helpful if the CPA has co op experience or anyone will do? Um, no, I. Well, I think if a CPA with co-op experience is available, that you know that's definitely the the preferable option. And by the way, there is an association. It's called the National Society of Accountants for Cooperatives. Um, and one thing you may want to ask is if they're a member of the National Society of Accountants for Cooperatives, um, because um, there we we have annual meetings. We have um, member meetings semi-annually, and there's a lot of education that goes on. And so if, if you have an auditor who is a member, or maybe you recommend that your auditor consider becoming a member of the um, National Society, I think it's, it's definitely preferable to have an auditor with co-op experience. But you know, I think with a lot of food cooperatives, the idea of even having an auditor is like director and officer liability insurance, it's cost prohibitive in a lot of cases. Um, so here's another uh, uh, couple of technical questions, I guess. Um, could you explain a little more why membership is not considered a security? Well, the, the basic point, and there's actually a, a case on this where a, a housing co-op was sued, and the the interest that they, they sued the co-op, this was a member who sued the co-op claiming that the co-op had not followed securities laws. And this went up to the Supreme Court and, and the Supreme Court, you know, said basically, um, you know, a security is something that either appreciates in value um, or it's something on which you receive a dividend. And in the case of the housing co-op, um, neither was true. Um, there was there was no expectation that the housing co-op membership would necessarily appreciate in value, which is the same way for 
any of the food co-op memberships. And there was no uh, promise of any dividend paid on the membership. So, you know, we just simply don't ever get into the land of securities if those if those are true. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is goes back to your disillusion uh, uh, examples, and uh, the question is, would you have to redeem WNAs upon dissolution? And I don't know what that stands for. So if you know. written notices of allocation. Okay, good. Yeah, you, you would. In fact, in this um, example, the eight thousand dollars of of allocated equity would be the written notice of allocation. That's how that equity arose. Um, yeah, $8,000 here is all from written notice of allocation. Oh, gotcha. And this $2,000 was all paid with a qualified check. Let's see. Here's some folks who have already started fundraising before they incorporated. How do they handle those monies for purposes of reporting when they incorporate? Well, that's a darn good question. Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to. Um, I guess it would depend upon what representations were made to the to the, those who who bought memberships. Um, one one way, and maybe the safest thing, would be to to you know get the entity formed and then offer make an offer that you know okay here's what we're going to do we're going to put this money into the corporation, but if there is anyone who who now wants to, you know, have their money back, you know, that they that they can do that and the co op would pay it back. I suspect that most people, you know, would say, well no, that's that's fine, go ahead and put it in the co op. Um, I guess the only difference after that is that, you know, at the inception of the co op, the co op is starting out with some cash that most Co ops wouldn't have it there at the very inception. And there, uh, in their case, a uh, little follow up clarification the funds weren't as a result of selling memberships, they were just, you know, uh, general fundraisers and things. I think there, Mark, that it would, it would, I guess I still want to know kind of um, what was the understanding of people who, who raised, who gave the money. Um, assuming the understanding was that, that the corporation would be formed. And that the money would be put into the co-op. Um, I guess I don't see any problem with with going ahead and doing that. I I guess from a, out of an abundance of caution, I'd probably still like to just make the offer back and say, okay, here's where we are. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, if anybody feels like they want, you know, their their money back, we'll do that. Um, still up for more Q&A? We got a few yeah. more here. Um, yep. We have a person who's writing in saying, we, if we have an organization acting as our fiscal agent and our account is audited through them, when do we file our first tax return? Well, the 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 organization that they've formed would still have a have a year end, um, and so the the tax return. Um, it would be like the the fiscal agent is is keeping track of the money, um, so they would have some reporting from the fiscal agent. But the co-op would still have a have a year end and a tax return owed to the government. Basically, the fiscal year end of a co-op can be you know just about anything that you want it to be. When you prepare the and file the SS4 for your employer ID number. Um, you're, you're asked on that form to, you know, declare when your year end is. Okay. A uh, person wrote in and asked on a practical level, how do co-ops generally identify and track non-member patrons? Actually, I, I, I would just say that they that they don't. Um, you know, if, a, for example, 
Um, some co-ops I work with run convenience stores where they sell gasoline and all the stuff inside the store. And in those cases, they will. some of them say, well, listen, if you keep track of your receipts, then at the end of the year, if you bring them in, we'll pay a, a patronage refund to you. Even though you're not a member, you know, we'll still treat you as a patron. But if you don't keep track of your receipts and, and don't come in and let us know what they are, then we don't track your business and we consider your business to be non-patronage. Okay. Um, somewhat related, uh, if we offer a separate class share, a non-patron investment, is the co-op mandated to offer a dividend on those shares when they give patronage allocations? Well, no, but I, I would just say this, that, that oftentimes the payment of the dividend um, is is something that the board typically wants to do because it wants the, the people who have provided capital to, um, uh, to, to receive some reward for having invested the capital. And so you, you can do both. You can pay a passage refund and you can pay, um, pay a dividend, but I guess a lot of times what I see is that if there's a choice, that oftentimes at least a, a small dividend is paid to the preferred holders and, and a smaller patronage dividend is declared for the, for the members. Um, that, Mark, let me just say that, you know, that would all depend too on, on how the, what the terms are of, of that um, class of preferred. Mm -hmm. The board has some discretion over how those are set up. And so they should be careful to talk with someone before they actually go out and sell, sell those shares. Joel, could you um, address uh, preferred shares versus owner loans and also um, how many classes of shares are too many? Well, let me first say that, you know, member loans or preferred pre preferred shares, now we're definitely into the land of, of security stuff because what we're doing is paying paying something for the use of, of that money. Um, so now we, we definitely have to make sure that we, you know, follow the securities laws. And some, like in Minnesota here, a Minnesota co-op could basically offer to any member a member loan or a preferred share without having to register it with the state. And as long as we did it all to Minnesota residents, um, we would have the intrastate exemption so we wouldn't have to register with the federal government either. But we still have, and we always have, whenever we offer a security, even if we haven't registered it, we, we have a duty to comply with the anti-fraud provisions of, of federal and state law. And and to protect ourselves from anybody later claiming, well, you didn't say this or you should have said that, um, that's the reason why we do a, a comprehensive disclosure document. And so with either a member loan or preferred stock, you'd want to prepare and distribute uh, typically three documents. One would be a, a disclosure statement, or you could think of it as a prospectus. One is a, subs uh, a subscription agreement. And the third would be a form of, let's say, a certificate of indebtedness. So the process is the member says, I want to invest in your member loan program. You send them out the disclosure statement and the subscription agreement. They look over the disclosure document, send back the, sub the subscription agreement with a check, and then you send them back their certificate of indebtedness. Or if it's a preferred stock, you probably send them back a preferred stock certificate. Um, but in either case, we we are dealing with a security and we want to make sure that, that we've um, disclosed everything as much as we can because directors can be personally liable and oftentimes even if you have DNO insurance, the DNO insurance won't protect you from from, from liability there. 
oftentimes do you know insurance has an exclusion for securities related liability could you just give an example of the type of exposure that you're talking about well let's let's say that um, that you issue a, a preferred stock to someone and they pay a hundred bucks and then uh, the the co-op goes under and you can't pay back uh, that hundred dollars theoretically the member um, has an action against the board if the board did not disclose if that is if the person who bought the, the preferred dividend could argue that well the board should have disclosed this or this wasn't disclosed and if it had been disclosed I would have made a different decision okay. so then they could come after the board for the hundred dollars and in that case um, the, the liability you know if, if one director had more money than another director theoretically that director with more money would be hit harder mm -hmm. um, than the other director okay thanks for that um, there's a uh, question coming in here is there any IRS issue with co-ops taking the deduction for patronage refunds 80% of which is recorded as allocated equity and never redeeming the allocated equity Well, that's, that's a darn good question because the IRS does have an expe expectation um, that the equity will be redeemed if the, if the co-op has money. Um, now, none of the co-ops I work with really have that uh, as, a, as a practical matter. Is it an, it, it, it's not an issue because they're doing what they can in terms of redeeming equity. And, and most of them aren't doing as well as they'd like. So um, from a practical point of view, as long as you're doing you know, what you can, um, there, there is not an issue. But I would also say that if you've accumulated a lot of capital and you aren't redeeming equity, that the IRS, I think, could challenge the board and ask, why aren't you redeeming the equity? We had a case where there was a this was a, a tobacco co-op, and I, I was really surprised. This co-op had like 50 million dollars of of surplus after it had sold off its assets, 50 million dollars of cash, and <clears throat> it it hadn't paid taxes. Um, no, wait a minute. Um, it had not redeemed all of all of its equity. And it was considering about doing something else with with the money, not paying it back. And I guess we we said that we thought that the IRS could well challenge the board if it had that much capital with really no need for it, and it wasn't going to redeem the equity. Um, we thought that would be a problem. Um, can we go back to your example of of uh, a potential? director exposure yeah um, uh, you had mentioned uh, that the um, uh, the person raising the uh, the claim would uh, need to say that the board didn't disclose something and a uh, clarification question came in what is it that the board uh, needs to disclose to the person to protect themselves from that exposure well Basically, it, it is the material risks um, that are associated with, with the project or with the co-op. Um, some of those are, are very, very straightforward, like, for example, that this co-op is a brand new company that has no history of, of operations. Um, I'll, th there are the disclosures that I that I had in the presentation are other ones that you'd want to include um, but there are there are other disclosures let and let me just say that I mean this is all at varying stages if we're talking simply about a, a co-op beginning raising some capital for seed capital you know I don't think there's as many disclosures to be made there as there is 
let's say we've we've done the initial feasibility and now we need a million dollars to build a new store. Okay. Now we have a greater obligation to disclose because you know we've got more more information to begin with and we're going out and asking people um, for a lot of money to build a store. Uh, so our, our obligation to disclose goes up. It, it, it varies, I guess, really with, with what what it is that you're asking money for. When you think about it, at the very beginning of a co-op, it's sort of hard, other than to say this is a brand new company that has no history of operation. Um, you're only going to have one vote, no matter how much you you pay for the membership, um, and we're going to do a feasibility study. And if it doesn't turn out, we'll you know we'll return what we can. I'm not sure you can say much more than that. Okay. Although if you ask any of my colleagues here, they could come up with ten pages of stuff very easily. <laughs> um, and and kind of along that line, if if a if a group was working with a um, uh, a, a local lawyer without uh, the co-op experience, is there any recommendations that you would make uh, to help uh, that uh, attorney get up to speed on, on co-op law most quickly? Well, I, I think the first thing that, you know, that that attorney should, should be looking for is whether or not there's a co-op exemption in, in, in the state. Um, and then second of all would be whether or not um, uh, he or she is up to speed on how to prepare a disclosure document. Um, you know, it, it, you'd be surprised. I was at a small law firm in New Ulm for a number of years, and and we didn't even carry insurance coverage, malpractice insurance coverage, for um, securities-related stuff because we just didn't do it. And we sort of ventured out on the fringe when we did co-op stuff because there, you know, we used to argue, well, it's, it's exempt or it is, it's not a security. But that doesn't get you very far if, if there's a, a problem that develops for the co-op and the directors and directors come back and sue the attorney. Um, so one thing you, you, I suppose you might want to ask is, is there coverage? You know, if, if this goes south and we have problems um, and we come looking to you, uh, Will there be coverage for us? Uh -huh. Good. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, any any comments or questions uh, at this point from you? No, thank you. Uh, Marilyn, anything uh, you'd like to throw in the pot? Um, no, I think Joel's done a good job of of covering the issues. Are, have we answered all the questions? We have answered all the questions. Oops. Have a, though there's always time to send in another one. <laughs> um, there's a question. Uh, did he cover coverage? And I'm not sure uh, what uh, um, Joel, you might you might know what that meant. That what that coverage is. Oh, um, so the board sure, isn't. Sir. Yeah. So the board isn't sued. Hmm. Did he cover coverage? So the board isn't sued. <coughs> How do you protect the board? Well, you know, I, uh, that's a darn good question that I don't think I really hit on directly. I sort of assumed a lot of things about that. But, um, you know, I, I think the board it, uh, really can be sued anytime, anywhere for almost anything. I mean, um, the, the being, uh, suing someone is not a problem in this country. So the board should always be aware of that. And even if you have DNO insurance, uh, that doesn't pre, you know, prevent you from being sued. What it does do is oftentimes provide for the, the payment of defense because the insurance company will oftentimes pick up and even pay for an attorney to, to represent the board. Um, I think it's very important for the, the board um, you know, to act with um, what I think of as informed consent, or not consent, but um, that their deliberations be informed and that their decisions be informed um, by access to, for example, um, a CDS consultant uh, or your attorney. Um, if something happens and someone sues you, 
uh, it's far better for the board to be able to say, well, we, we actually sought professional help from a CDS consultant, and, and here's what and why we did what we did, or this is what our attorney you know, said that we should do. Um, it's always better to have that kind of cover than it is to be acting um, on your own and have not thought through the issues um, well enough. So it's always important to um, chronicle that process. I don't think that, that when, in terms of the minutes of the meeting, um, I don't want you to jot down what everybody said during the meeting. I think it's important that, for example, that the minutes say, you know, tonight we, we discussed um, what's happening with our, our food co-op, why it's losing money, um, and we've commissioned uh, a CDS consultant to help us figure that out. Um, motion made and seconded and, uh, and had that on the books. Um, then a couple months later, maybe we see uh, an entry in the minutes that, okay, the CDS consultant presented, you know, and here's what's going on. And, and here's what decisions we made or, or here's why we're not making a decision right now. Um, and, you know, go forward from there. Uh, the, the minutes, what we want the minutes to chronicle is, is what was going through the board's mind and why did they do what they did? And if they didn't do anything, why didn't they do anything and, and what are they waiting for to get before they do something? Um, you know, one thing I didn't mention as an aside, but let me just say one thing about drafting the, the articles and bylaws is and I mentioned this earlier, we, we all want a co-op to be as uh, egalitarian as possible. Um, but I, I sometimes feel like it's possible to, to create too much democracy in a co-op <clears throat> um, because we're always trying to, you know, almost overcompensate. Um, I have seen a couple times where, just as an, as an example, bylaws, um, and in most cases, the bylaws provide that the board can terminate a member, you know, period. That's where the story ends. But in some cases, I've seen bylaws that do allow, you know, for example, like the, the, the member who the board terminated to appeal um, to, to the membership. And I personally have some concerns with that because I think those kinds of things can just tear up the membership. Um, and I, I think if, if the board didn't like what, what occurred, you know, as an example, or I'm sorry, the member and the members didn't like what occurred, um, one, their, their um, recourse is to replace the board. And then, you know, for that person to reapply for membership. Um, I, I think we need to be careful about actions that, that I think can put a lot of pressure on memberships and, and can tear them up rather than... Um, you know, make it harmonious. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Joel. And here's a little member uh, level question. A uh, uh, person was writing in saying that sometimes they're asked by members whether the members could be sued for actions of the co-op. Any member exposure? Um, there's virtually None that I can think of, and Chris, if you may have other ideas about this, the only thing I can think of is that in some cases, for example, environmental laws can actually come through to the underlying stockholders, but I, I don't think there'd be anything, you know, environmentally that would even be an issue, and even then it's hard to, to come through to the members. Members are pretty insulated. You, you've basically got exposure up to your investment. Mm -hmm. And I suppose... The caveat to that would be if there's any member sort of gross negligence or willful misconduct in the capacity of being on a committee, a board committee. Yes, yes. That's true. But that's Good a pretty point. extreme example. Yeah. So I have two last little questions here, and then we should probably wrap it up. Um, this one is uh, back to the allocation uh, topics. Um, can we get IRS exemption before we actually allocate, or does it happen the first time the co-op has an allocation? Um, the, the way that it's typically done is that 
we, we make sure that the bylaws have the pre-existing obligation and, and then we just take, you know, take the tax deduction. Um, there is a way, I suppose, of asking for an advance ruling from the IRS. I mean, you, you can ask the IRS for, for rulings on various things, and I, um, I'm sure you could ask for one, uh, but I'm not sure that, from my point of view, it, it would be an unnecessary cost. Uh, the preparation of a ruling is a lot, you know, probably at least 10000 bucks, mm -hmm. if not more. And, uh, and I, I think it would be unnecessary. Okay. Um, a person was writing in just for clarification, perhaps on uh, what is uh, the director's and officer's insurance and, and what stage would you recommend that uh, a group get that? As soon as you can afford it. Um, and that may not be for a couple of years. But it, as soon as you can afford it. Okay. And um, Marilyn, do you want to close the session? Yeah, sure. I just want to uh, thank Joel and Chris for your advice and expertise today. It was very helpful. We have another webinar scheduled uh, one week from today, same time, same place. Uh, that one will be on uh, uh, governance and accountability. Uh, Mark Goring will be presenting that on Wednesday, October 1st. Uh, we hope you're registered and that you'll come. Um, if not, go to our website and you can sign up. Today's materials uh, are available on the website and a recording was made, uh, which will also be posted there as soon as it's available, we'll let you know. And lastly, there is uh, you'll have an opportunity to evaluate today's session, and uh, we really um, use the, the comments that you make on the evaluations to inform the work that we do in future sessions. Please note that your conference will expire in 10 minutes. So that? please take a few minutes to uh, fill out that evaluation uh, when you have that opportunity. Yeah, great. And but that actually will be emailed to people uh, after, uh, after the session is over. That's how that survey is going right now. Oh, thanks again, Joel and Chris, and thank you, Mark, um, and thank you, Stuart.